Thank you. Um, so this is joint work with uh, Katril Kaas, Håkon, and Tibor. And uh, we're going to talk about a highly efficient key exchange protocol uh, that we've looked at. And we're also going to say something about tightness and efficiency. Um, so the current situation, when you look at key exchange protocols, and indeed many other protocols, is that we have security proofs for a lot of these, but the proofs are not tight in the sense that if you were to deploy them with what we'd call theoretically sound security parameters, you would get a very slow scheme, so people don't do that. Instead, they deploy with what seems like convenient parameters. In fact, they're treating the security proof as a heuristic, not as a proof. Um, so what we have also is schemes that have what's known as tight security. You can deploy them with the key sizes we use today, and you get a proper security guarantee. But as we saw with Jostan Jager last year at Crypto, such schemes tend to be a bit inefficient. They are slower, quite a bit slower than what you'd like to have, even though if you uh, deploy with theoretically sound parameters, they're still faster than the alternatives. So the question that we started looking at is, can we get more efficient scheme using theoretically so sound parameters? Okay, so the thing we're talking about is implicitly authenticated key exchange. Um, Alice and Bob, they want to exchange a key, but in this model, we don't really, we, we want, don't want to limit us to just two people, we want lots of people. So we have lots of people who want to exchange keys, um, they can do many key exchanges between many different people. We are going to say that the adversary is the one that schedules all these key exchanges that gives him more power, which is good, because if we can prove security against more powerful adversaries, we have more security. The adversary, he can do a key reveal, which is uh, simply learning some previous session key. He can also do a test where he gets the real or the random key. This is what he's supposed to decide. Did I now see a random string or did I see the key they actually agreed on? In our model, the one we prove, the adversary is allowed to do many test queries. Why do we do that? First of all, because we can, and second, because that's very convenient when you're going to use your key exchange as a sub-protocol in some other protocol you're analyzing. Then it's very convenient to have lots of test queries. The adversary, of course, controls the network, and the adversary can adaptively corrupt users. So this is our adversary model, and our goal for security, and this is implicitly authenticated key exchange. So if Alice somehow believes she has exchanged a key with Bob, then Bob is the only one who could possibly know that key. If he participated, if Bob didn't participate in the key exchange, then there's no one but Alice that knows the key. And moreover, there's only one instance of Bob that has this key. And this is sufficient that the implicit authentication says that when you start using this key, if you can use it successfully, the authentication is there. And of course, to get implicit authentication, this key has to look random to everyone who was not supposed to learn the key. Right, now security proofs. Why do we have security proofs? Well, the traditional form where you have a polynomial time adversary gives a polynomial time solver, blah, blah, blah. Um, this ensures that your system is not, let's call it structurally breakable. There's no easy way to break your system that avoids the, uh, the hard problem underlying it. But still, I mean, it doesn't really help you with the one interesting problem, namely, what should I use as a security parameter? So we have concrete security where you say, okay, if adversary with time t1, blah, 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 blah. This does allow us to say something about which security parameters should we use. Unfortunately, a lot of our, like I said, a lot of our schemes aren't really tight, so T2 tends to be a lot bigger than T1. And if you want 
T2, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, a lot smaller, I should say, uh, than T1. And if you want a really big T1, a big T2, then you need a huge T1, and you have to choose, uh, yeah. Okay, I'm probably messing this up, but anyway. Uh, so what we want, one approach to do this is what we call tight security, where T1 and T2 are essentially the same, because then you don't have these problems. But this tends to result in slow schemes. So our approach in this paper is to make a trade-off. So we're going to do two trade-offs. We're going to trade off a bit of efficiency compared to the fastest, and when we're talking efficiency, we're talking number of exponentiations. And we're going to trade off a little bit of tightness, and the result is a hugely more efficient protocol when you instantiate it with theoretically sound parameters. Let me just, before I start going on to an the analysis of our main protocol, say a few things about the other results in our paper, a few other results. So this tightness loss that we are giving ourselves, this is, for a large class of key exchange protocols, optimal. You cannot get away from having this uh, tightness loss. And we have a really nice proof uh, using meta reduction techniques, which I'm not going to talk about. You'll have to read the paper. Um, we also, our main protocol is going to depend on strong Diffie-Hellman. This is an interactive assumption. Some people don't like those. For those people, we also have a few other variants that depend on just plain ordinary computational Diffie-Hellman or plain ordinary Diffie decision Diffie-Hellman. And then we use twinning techniques and possibly in combination with uh, uh, the commitment trick from uh, Yersten and Yage last year. Um, the cost then, of course, is that you get more exponentiations. Twinning basically doubles the number of exponentiations at some point. So these have weaker underlying assumptions, but they have more cost. So they're not as efficient. They're still reasonably nice compared to other uh, protocols. So they're still good, just not as good as our main protocol. And then, of course, you can debate how does uh, strong Diffie-Hellman with a faster protocol compare against uh, a slightly more expensive protocol. Shouldn't you really increase your security parameters if you're using strong Diffie-Hellman instead of computational Diffie-Hellman? There are some things that you can debate there, uh, uh, which we haven't really looked at yet, but uh, it's an interesting thing. People who do algorithms might want to look at this. Um, so let's start with our protocol, and this is really an old idea. This is not a protocol, this is plain Diffie-Hellman. So we all know this and we all love it. Um, and you'll see this is not post-quantum at all. Um, there are lots of variations. If you add some public keys with Diffie-Hellman, you can do this static ephemeral trick where you take one public key, you combine it with the other guy's ephemeral key and vice versa, and then you hash it all up, and now you have a nice key exchange protocol. This is, I believe, key A or something. Um, but obviously, you don't have to stick with static ephemeral. You can also put a static static, sorry, ephemeral ephemeral term in there. Uh, you can put some names in there. You can put some public keys in there. And one of the tricks that really make the security proof go through is this. Uh, we put the actual messages of the protocol in there. That's good crypto hygiene. You really want to do this to make sure that no one confuses anything and you're not doing something silly. But it also helps our security proof go through. Without these two terms inside the hash, we couldn't get the security proof to go through. We'd get a quadratic term, so our uh, our runtime would be uh, would blow up, unfortunately. So this is actually a kind of a tricky uh, thing, uh, but these things are really important inside there. They're not just there for crypto hygiene. Okay, so our proof. The first thing we do in our proof is that we say, well, we're going to be a bit lazy with our random oracles. We're just not going to bother evaluating them. So what we do is 
when the key exchange protocol finishes and it needs to determine its key, we just choose a random key. And we don't bother querying the hash oracle. And when someone queries the hash oracle at the appropriate point at a later time, then we just reprogram the hash oracle so that the adversary sees something that's consistent. This is a perfectly standard thing that we do all the time. And the idea then, our strategy for doing the proof is that we stop this reprogramming. Because then once you've stopped all the reprogramming from happening, what happens then is that the adversary, he can query the oracle, but the oracle has been disconnected from the keys we actually choose when we stopped reprogramming. Which means the keys no longer come from the oracle, just, just random strings. So in our final game, the adversary, if he gets the real keys, he gets a bunch of random strings that are, have no relation to anything, or he gets a bunch of random strings that are not related to anything, which means trivially he doesn't have any advantage. That's our strategy. There are some obstacles. We have to be really careful about making a consistent experience for the adversary so that when he corrupts too much, he will be able to recover the keys. He will be able to query the hash oracle at the right place, and then he must get the correct hash value, which is the key that we agreed on a bit earlier. So we have to be a bit careful there. Um, and that's where we need the strong defilement. We need to recognize when the adversary is querying the hash oracle at the right place. And then we get a really nice theorem. The tightness loss is linear in the number of users. And as I said, this is for this class of protocols, for a large class of protocols, this tightness loss is optimal. Right, so in the security proof, I'm going to very quickly run through a few of the cases. Um, you can see that Either you have an initiator, there are two, in a, key, in a standard key exchange protocol, there are two uh, parties, there's the initiator and there's the responder. And then for an implicitly authenticated protocol, there are really four cases. The initiator, he might either have a partner or he might not have a partner, which means that the response that this oracle gets came from the adversary. Well, it, the adversary might, have, but it do, doesn't come from an oracle that matches R, that has a matching conversation with us. Um, and this is where the obstacle happens because this person could become corrupted later, which means the adversary learns its long-term key, which means it might actually pair off with this guy. That turns the session non-fresh, so that's okay, but it's still a thing that we really have to take care not to mess up. Um, responder oracles, they, of course, can have or not have a partner. The nice thing about the responder oracles is that when they receive their first message, we know if they're going to have a partner or if they, go if they can have a partner or not. Um, with the initiator oracles, we start by sending out a message and we have no idea whether we're going to end up with an initiator oracle that has a partner or that hasn't got a partner. And that simplifies quite a lot of stuff. Um, dealing with the initiator oracles that have a partner, which we know at the time they're going to decide their key, that's very easy. Because now you know you have a matching conversation, so you just forget about all those key computation and you just steal the key from your partner oracle. So then we get rid of them. There's no more detail to these kinds of initiator oracles anymore. They uh, take care of themselves. The initiator, then we deal with responder oracles, responder oracles that we know will not have a partner. And how do we do uh, this? And it's at this point tightness loss happens because we need to guess a public key where we can put the, uh, the uh, strong Diffie-Hellman instance in. So we guess one partner, not the person that we're going to deal with the oracle, but the person that oracle is talking to. 
So we guess that guy's which what so that means we have one key. This key we cannot reveal. We do not know the key. Instead, we're going to have to use this strong Diffie-Hellman oracle that we have to recognize when the adversary could have done something bad. And if you look really carefully at this query, you'll realize that we don't know all the terms there. But this is actually an interesting thing about our proof. Uh, the adversary, to be able to get this query right, he has to guess all of the three terms, both the ephemeral static, the static ephemeral, and the ephemeral ephemeral. While we, in our reduction, in order to win, we only need to get one of them right, and that's the one we can recognize with our static Diffie-Hellman key. Okay, and then when we do this, we have to be a bit careful with the others, so we have to set up all of the recognizing of everyone else's oracle. But then typically we have more information for the other guys. So we get this to work. Um, when we do responder oracles that have a partner, then we can use plain old decision Diffie-Hellman. We don't need this recognizing thing. Because what we know is that if we use decision Diffie-Hellman in this case, um, we just put the decision Diffie-Hellman real or random term into the hash oracle. And we know that if this is a random term, the adversary is never going to query the hash oracle at that point, which means if we ever see him querying anything at that point, well, then we know that uh, this is the real thing. So this is quite simple. Uh, and again, we can recognize when we win. And the same thing for initiator oracles. Uh, we uh, can deal with all of the corner cases. And essentially, that's the way the proof goes. There are some few technicalities. You have to take care that uh, nonces are not repeated and stuff in order to simplify everything. But you end up with this nice result. The loss in tightness is linear. In, in practice, we end up that the adversary's key exchange advantage is bounded by um, and uh, the number of users times the uh, strong oracle advantage of two different adversaries and the decision Diffie-Hellman advantage of one adversary. So now let's see how we end up with a really efficient scheme here. So we decided to uh, do a small comparison with HMQV. There are lots of security proofs for HMQV and they have different tightness. And it also depends a bit on which assumption you use. So we said HMQV is, uh, has a quadratic tightness loss in the number of users and the number of sessions. That's sort of the best we could find. Our protocol has a tightness loss that's linear in the number of users. So let's see what the effect is. We have two small, uh, a small scale and a large scale uh, situation. Large scale, Facebook, small scale, any other reasonably big thing. Um, and when you go for a 112-bit security uh, level, we end up with NIST 256-bit curve is suitable for our protocol in the small scale. In the large scale, we have to have the 384-bit curve. Um, what you see here is that um, if you do the tightness loss computation, 384 is a bit too big. Could have done it with a smaller one, but this is the only one that's deployed. If you were going to deploy this with today, immediately, you'd have to choose one of these standard curves, and they are not available in every bit size you can imagine. So that's why we have a small loss. So this is not a perfect scaling, uh, but I think HMQV, it's reasonable. Uh, it's not too bad over a... And then we took some timings from OpenSSL running on one of our computers, and you see our protocol is simply a lot faster when you instantiate it with uh, uh, theoretically sound parameters. Now, of course, if you just do what everyone does today and instantiate it with P256, everything, HMQB is faster than our protocol, but not by a huge amount. 
because our protocol requires four exponentiations, HMQB requires, say, two and a half. So it's not, it's not like our protocol is completely out there. It is actually very efficient. So to summarize, uh, there are really highly efficient protocols that can be instantiated with theoretically sound parameters, namely our protocol. Um, with theoretically sound parameters, we're the best. With, if you don't care about theoretically sound, we're still good. Uh, if you look at things like the noise framework, you find essentially the same thing as our protocol inside there, uh, except our protocol has a nice analysis now. And also we've shown that our results with respect to tightness loss is essentially optimal. Questions? Thank you. So we'll have some time for questions. If you have questions, please come up to the uh, front microphone so that everyone can hear you. What is the meaning of tightness in the random oracle model? Because, I mean, you were doing this comparison between heuristic and theoretically sound, and you're seeing this thing, but then now you have tightness in the random oracle model. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I agree. Uh, my interpretation is that the random oracle heuristic says that uh, your adversary is not going to care about the hash oracle. Uh, the hash function. He's not going, that's not where he's going to mess with your key exchange protocol. So at some point, the adversary that you have, he's going to put some value into the hash oracle, and he's going to, uh, sorry, into the hash function, and he's going to simply evaluate the hash function. And what we're doing is base, what our adversary, the adversaries that we construct are basically doing, they are basically uh, just looking at what the adversary is putting inside the hash, or, uh, the hash function, He's just, they're just observing. This reprogramming isn't that essential. That's just used for the, that's an artifact of the proof. But they're looking there. And I believe that it's a reasonably good heuristic that if you take a real adversary against a, a key exchange protocol, it's going to behave like that. So that means that this adversary is going to do something that you can observe if you mess a bit mess about a bit inside him, and then you should be able to get a real adversary against underlying strong diffie -Hellman. That's my feeling, but of course, this is heuristic, this is a bit vague, um, that, but that's, that's my interpretation of this. Thanks. All right, Just no further questions, let's thank Christian again. <laughs>